to kick off to advance the, uh, the, the, the proposition. In six minutes. In six minutes. And six ruthlessly, minutes. please. I'm going to set my stopwatch right now. <laughs> okay. The first part about the economics is clearly, I think you need to first establish to what extent inequality is a necessary or indeed inevitable result of the way society operates. I will not talk about, because I don't believe it is true, that inequality is required to produce growth, but I very much believe that growth will result in higher inequality, or indeed in any inequality. And the prime phase, if you look at it, obviously inequality has persisted for thousands of years. And the fundamental economic reason, I think, was set out very elegantly by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, and it is the division of labor leading to greater and greater specialization. And both of these things are build, build upon and entail increasing returns to capital. So the deployment of capital will lead to and generate uh, high returns for those who succeed in their investment decisions. And those returns will inevitably over time, just with the law of compound interest result in an unequal distribution of the returns on capital, your income, and obviously the capital stock itself. These kind of stratospheric returns on capital are just a symptom of a much more pervasive feature of life in general, which is that a lot of things are extremely unequally distributed. And there is no reason prima facie to believe that income and capital are somehow exempt from this force of nature. These Pareto or power law distributions are completely pervasive throughout the world. If you look at the distribution of earthquakes, city sizes, uh, the frequency of words in languages, they all follow these 80-20 kind of distributions. Purely logically, someone has to explain to me why that should not, even if you wish it didn't, but why should not apply to income and capital as well? My view as an economist is that inequality, even in largely market-based economies, is not just the arbitrary outcome of market forces, as some might believe. More significant is the influence of policies, competition policies, taxation policies, and education policies, and the values that societies have. As a result, any given level of inequality is not inevitable, and we can see the differences between countries, and is a result largely of the planned or unintended consequences of the policy choices which have been made. And inequality is deeply embedded in society and it reflects barriers to opportunity, it reflects societal values, and it reflects poorly designed policies. It's not just the bad luck of those at the bottom. Is there anything worrying about the divergence in one example of outcomes of two girls who were born with the same level of ability in the same country at the same time? Are these experiences typical or just a random example. And as you may have already discerned, this story is not exceptional, this is the norm. It in fact is a counterfeit statistical representative example. It's based on the mathematical probability of the likely outcome using detailed panel-based evidence. Their story is based on econometric correlations between average outcomes for individuals based only on one thing, the income deciles of their parents. And in conclusion, I would like to argue this is not inevitable. There are ways of altering these probabilities of outcomes for individuals like Sarah and Jane without damaging economic performance. And I would ask you to think about one question. Would you favour such policies which would change the outcomes for people like Sarah and Jane? I can't give you econometric correlations, I'm afraid. I can barely spell them, which is a shame because I'm a journalist, so I probably should be able to spell. Um, but put your hand up if you are a Weidenfeld scholar. Very good. And put your hand up if you are at an Oxford College or have been at an Oxford College. 
I rest my case. Where would any of you be without in economic inequality? You are the beneficiaries of philanthropy, which is one of the coroll corollaries of economic inequality. And it's not just Lord Weidenfeld today. It is, I went to Magdalen uh, 500 years ago, 600 years ago, William of Waynefleet thought, you know what? Let's have a college in Oxford where we can educate scholars. Trinity itself was founded by Thomas Pope uh, with, I think, uh, I'm not sure why he had so much money. I think he was religious, but was probably shouldn't have had that. William of Wayne was a bishop as well. Um, John de Balliol, uh, famously a bandit who apparently kidnapped the Bishop of Durham and to atone decided to set up a college for in Oxford on behalf of, in, in his name, his wife did with his ill-gotten Ill gains. Now, those are all results of economic inequality, and we wouldn't change a single one of them because they have brought us all here today. Economic inequality exists, but what you can do with economic inequality is turn it to the better. I think that if you look at philanthropy, you'll see that this is the most powerful argument, philanthropy and patronage, the most powerful arguments for economic inequality. Well, this year, reporting on last year, reported that the three, 300 of the people in the rich list gave £2.6 billion to charity. To rebut uh, one of Alan's points, he said uh, inequality leads to inefficiency. I don't know anyone who is more inefficient at spending money than the government. If you want, in if you want efficiency, give, let philanthropists, business people, earn you who have their money, who've earned their money, spend it in good charitable ways because they are the people who, they understand what, to get, what it is to get a return. The government doesn't know how to run things. And if they, we cannot rely on the government to do any of these things. With the government, we would never have had the Weidenfeld programme. We would never have had half these Oxford colleges. We wouldn't still have half the things we have today. And we have it because well-meaning people who have benefited from economic inequality have decided to give everyone else in the world a leg up. And that is something we need to approve of. Thank you very much. In other words, you can't look at inequality and compare countries and say, those unequal, more unequal, grow less strongly. Actually, you can't. There are societies that are able to manage people who are equal and people who are well, and those who are unequal too seem to be able overall to have considerable growth. But what the difference is, of course, is the money that people earn at the bottom by comparison to those that earn uh, little money at the top. And that tends to be where the emphasis is. But of course, what tends to happen too, given that what we just heard, in more unequal societies, it is indeed those who accumulate an awful lot of money who feel a little bit guilty and therefore spend money in charity. <laughs> of course, charities are the most inefficient entities there are. If you think the public sector is inefficient, go and work in a charity and see. <laughs> so what has to happen, of course, in a more equal society is that the money that we need to spend on medical research or on anything else is spent by the state. But of course, where it's spent, it, it's determined by your democratic vote. Where we can make a big contribution in this debate is to prove that equality actually helps growth. So let me just pick one area where there is huge inequality and where one can make a huge difference by changing policies. And that one is women. As we probably know, if you look across uh, various countries, there are huge differences to women's participation at work, to women's, women's emancipation, and to women's contribution, therefore, to the economy. The Japanese have calculated that their GDP would be 20% higher at least. And that has come out of the current Prime Minister doing, doing a study on this, or commissioning a study on this. That it would be 20% higher if women were participating in equal measure as men in the working population. So my argument, therefore, is that through proper policies, equality, and that's just one example, can actually lead to much faster growth and better prosperity for all, and inequality, and it's not an inevitable consequence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it seems to me there are two active ingredients in this motion. One is inequality, and the other is necessity. And I'd like to suggest to you that you argued very strongly that inequality exists, uh, but you didn't argue that it was a necessity. No, but if the existence of inequality is inevitable, then it is by default necessary. I mean, it is a necessary consequence of a process. And if you say the process inevitably causes inequality, then it's sort of necessary. What matters is not that everyone should have the same. What matters is that everyone should have enough. And the truth is, all of us 
most of the time when we talk about inequality, in reality we're talking about absolute poverty. Now, dealing with absolute poverty is very important. It is not inevitable that it exists. It is not necessary to exist. And that's what you should focus well, on. And then I'm on the other side, I, I, I was very taken by the emotionally charged story of Sarah and Jane. <laughs> um, but I began to wonder where on earth in the world would Sarah and Jane have had a better deal? I think the issue, John, is not, um, um, you know, compared with some other countries, how Sarah and Jane would come. But that, and there, it's not an isolated example. If one shows me anyone and tells me what their income level is of their parents, I can predict with great certainty what is the probable outcome for most people from that community. If the objective of charity and inequality is to alter the chances of people in society, it's been a complete failure. The factor is that a number of outliers in this room that has benefited really has no impact on any. First of all, I think it's really a Panglossian fantasy to suggest that philanthropic capitalism is what's necessary to solve major public problems throughout the world. I want to focus specifically on the Bill and Melinda Gates. I think that you've grossly misrepresented what that institution does around the world. It hasn't eradicated any diseases. Yes, I agree that it's pushing to eradicate smallpox, but hasn't got there yet. Secondly, there is extensive evidence from public health professionals, political economists, historians of medicine and philosophers, all arguing that the, the foundation actually does more harm than good. It leads to health system fragmentation, siloization of different health programs, vertical programs rather than broad-based primary care. Who are the losers, the poor, the vulnerable, usually black, usually African. Moreover, I think that um, when, when, you, when you start to emphasize and naturalize this idea that uh, capitalists have this sort of imperative and goodness to go around redistributing, well, well, what about the democratic voice? Is that not a social good that we value? That is um, I, thank you for your point. I, you know, I'm sure you're right about what you say, um, that there probably are ways in which they could be better and that philanthropic capitalism is not the cure-all, and I don't think it is the cure-all. And Bill Gates himself says, you can't, there's no point, you know, he doesn't tackle, you're right, he doesn't tackle these problems by himself. If you don't like Bill Gates, take Jimmy Carter, for example. He's focusing on forgotten diseases in Africa, and he, with his, the help of the concentration and the money of his foundation, he's virtually eradicated, helped to eradicate, worked with governments to eradicate schistosomiasis, which is one of the biggest killers of people in Africa. So you're right, philanthropy is not, and philanthropic capitalism are not the answers to all of the world's problems. Governments need to be there. I'm not suggesting they don't. But you need people who work innovatively, much more so than governments ever do, whether privately or publicly, to be able to combat the problems that face us today. Um, um, just a very quick point. The, um, and I'd like to thank Josh for making a very powerful argument for our side of the table. <laughs> I'm helpful. That, uh, you know, there's these exceptional individuals who make large charitable donations. But the really interesting fact he raised, which I was going to raise in my own presentation, is that on average, the very wealthy give 1.2%, I think was the figure, to charity. That means we're allowing a society to be structured which gives this extraordinary wealth to a very small group, whereby they keep nearly 99% for themselves. My worry about this debate is that the pressure on this team here is extreme, <laughs> but the willingness of the people in the room to live under a system which uh, they prosper under um, is such that there is a great deal of hypocrisy in play. So, I think the problem is, the problem you face uh, intellectually and also in practically is how do you translate and transform the specific incident into a general scheme that can be rolled out fairly and justly and equally, i.e. applying equally to similar circumstances across a country or a world. That's the problem. Um, so, so, so there is that, there is that issue. So first of all, you, you, you try to eliminate the wage gap as much as you possibly can. Um, and, uh, and, and you, you make sure that companies also 
have a limit to the, 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 the how many times higher than the lowest paid worker a chief executive can get. Well, so, what is your policy for forcing? For forcing? Hmm. Oh, you, you... How do you force? Oh, what you can do in terms of forcing... First of all, we've already changed the... The, the law has been changed to make it sort of mandatory for them all to, to vote for things. The second thing you can do is change the majority that is required for, for that to happen, because at present, you know, the big shareholders can still go in there, but there are so many smaller uh, investors, and you still can't get the, your point through. So that can be changed. Uh, and the other one, of course, is name and shame. Uh, it looks a little bit like um, we'd have to make a choice between excellence and equality. And if we have to make a choice between excellence and equality, which side do you want? I, I certainly would not favor any policy that was a choice between excellence and equality. Inequality levels that are now existing in nearly all the developed countries is not inevitable. It's the result of poorly designed policies. Sometimes those policies have happened just because of stupidity in governments, and sometimes it's corruption. And that's an area, and I suspect that Josh and Andreas would agree that those policies don't make sense. Yes to everything um, Vicky and Alan said. Yes to getting rid of remuneration committees. Yes to limiting executive pay. Yes to all of these things. Yes to equalising pay for men and women. Yes to everything. And More whose hand? And whose hand? The government's hand. Uh, this Equal government that you don't have a lot of time for. I, don't, I think the government is very good at... No one else can legislate for that to happen. And if you rely on companies to do it, they won't because companies are basically selfish. Companies exist to give money to their shareholders. Governments are incompetent. Governments are... Governments, government, because, governments are, because governments are incompetent at running programmes. They're not incompetent at passing laws. They're very, effect, they're very efficient at passing laws. Yet we don't... We want less inequality. No, we are not arguing for more inequality. Now. However, there are... In a capitalist society, there are always going to be inequalities, and the people who are the beneficiaries of that can use their money for good. That does not mean, to go back to your point, that the guy in the mine should be paid any less than what he deserves. He should get everything that he deserves, and there is no reason a capitalist society can't exist with that. There will still be inequalities, but the people at the top can then ameliorate it through other means as well. Because what the side of the house has to show us is that grasping the nettle of inequality produces a greater good what they've told us is deeply inconsistent. What they've told us is we should grasp the nettle of inequality because it produces, guess what, more equality. We heard in 1500 we were so unequal, and because of economic inequality, we're somehow now more equal. We also heard from the second speaker that don't worry about inequality, guys, because guess what, it'll be redistributed, mm -hmm. so there'll be more equality. As uh, that side said, we hope they can do the right things. I wrote this in big letters here. Mm. We hope. Um, that's not what you should rely on. You should rely on actually having the democratic mandate to do the right things that you want them to do, to allow this prosperity to spread across. Because um, what you said is that uh, you know, you, you're taking a moral view on it, and we're taking a view of the actual statement itself. Inequality is necessary. If you want to have capitalism, not unrestrained capitalism, even moderate capitalism, inequality is necessary. And yes, it's evil. That is the point. We are, that is entirely correct. We do not believe that inequality is a good thing. However, when it comes about, it is worth being, seeing what you can get from it. Yes, we hope. We certainly do hope. But the only other alternative to hope is force. And that is not what we want governments to do. So what you want is a free society with an equal distribution of political power. It will create economic inequality as a necessary and inevitable outcome, but it is not undesirable. Right. So there you have it. And now you have to make up your minds.